Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub. From lithic casts to impact blasts from the ancient past, glad as always to be here. And joining me, as always, I of course am your friendly neighborhood podcaster, Micah Hanks, Jason Pintrail, and James Waldo also in the house. Jason, my friend, how are you? I am good. I'm sitting in a empty house. It's just me, the computer, and a couple of Fender Telecasters. Boy, and quarantine so, has taken on an uh, all new meaning for you, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, what a time to have to move right in the middle of a quarantine. But nonetheless, it has to be done. Uh, so here we are. Yeah, somebody in our team is always on the move. Before you, it was James Waldo, and it looks like you're finally getting settled over there, sir. Yeah, you know, with the working from home, I kind of had kind of had just like partially put my home office together. You know, I basically had it set up functional enough that we could record and that was pretty much it. But now I'm spending about 10 hours a day working in here. So I got everything, you know, most everything put up. I got my guitars hung up on the wall. I got, you know, every, I got all my workstations up, which you guys can't see here. I've got, you know, the one laptop and then I got two more over to the side, you know, one's my work laptop, one's and then two personal ones. One I keep like during the day I watch uh, the news on. I just have like a constant stream of information coming in while I'm working. So anyway, it's coming together. I got my nice mini fridge up here. It's stocked full of uh, cold drinks and, you know, what have you. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming along. I still got some work to do. And I'm thinking about adding some, some of those uh, uh, sound, uh, those foam tiles, you know, that you yeah. can mm-hmm. put on the wall. I thought about doing the whole place in this and what you can't see on the front of this room with the the ceiling is not the the standard ceiling this room is i think it was like an unused space under the roof line in the front of the house of the roof line on this house is a little funky so uh so the roof line the ceiling is like a 45 degree angle so it's kind of a neat kind of a neat space yeah absolutely from home office to studio to situation room (laughs) that's right whatever the world throws at him james waldo is prepared. Well, I'm glad. And it's it really is important to have a environment that is uh, both functional, but also that is enjoyable to be in if you're going to be working in it a lot. And, uh, you know, my own studio right now, to me, I think needs an upgrade. I guess it's just that spring cleaning vibe is in the air. Mm-hmm. It's it's going through my mind. I'm going to start fixing things up. You know, our pal Jeff that came with us and actually helped us down there at White Pond. Yeah, uh, has recently yeah. Uh, indicated to me that he has an old desk, which for this to be an old desk, it's really nice. But he said, you know, I think this might look good in your studio. And I said, that's it. You know what? Let's give it a home. The upgrade is underway. So next time you guys wow. see me, things may look all different. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, though. I, I, these tables that I've got in here, are just, you know, the, the folding style tables that you might have it, you know extended family for thanksgiving or whatever but they're functional but i would like to have a nice desk up here you mm-hmm. know at some point well you know next time somebody offers me a nice uh secondhand desk i'll i'll send it your way of course it's got a little ways further to travel to get all the way yeah. out there to the ozarks yeah. my friend but we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have to do it by a uh, covered wagon <laughs> <laughs> you know I, the other day i was i was uh, there was a post on facebook and it had to do with like some some history uh type things for the region that i'm from and i and i had a a relative he's passed away now his name was Pony page and he was kind of a famous you know regional author and did a, you know did a bunch of family histories and a bunch of things but he used to write a column for the local newspaper and it's called this and that and it's just kind of like local 
thing going ons and reminiscings about things that had gone in the past. Well, anyway, there was a guy who was at the time, this was about 40 years ago. This gentleman was about 80 something years old. And he told a story about when he was 17, his family went, I want to say it was Willis, Texas, which is down around Houston. And it, it was just a short blurb, but it, the guy said <clears throat> that it took them 21 days to get back home to the Ozarks by covered wagon. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, man, you can drive that in a day now. Yeah. It's Oregon trail stuff right there. Yeah. Yes. They it, went down for work or and he's like, we went down we stayed a few weeks and then it took us 21 days to get back. And I thought, wow. Yeah, man. Stories like that just fascinate me. I, I love hearing about the way of life in the ancient past and also in the more recent past, like what you're describing. And it really, I think, especially at times like these that we're currently operating in, it kind of puts things into perspective for you. And so, yes, I enjoy stories like that. But, you know, I also mentioned the ancient past. And so uh, we've actually got a very special guest joining us here for this first segment of this week's podcast, a gentleman who is actually also a sponsor now of the Seven Ages Audio Journal, uh, which we couldn't be happier to have him on board. And what he produces also, I think, really bespeaks getting a mind for the ancient way of life. And when we talk about archaeology, often we are talking about people who go and who remove the layers of soil, and occasionally they may be so lucky as to find some artifact or, or you know, a a feature or something of significance that tells us something unique about the ancient past. But there are so many other ways that science and very specialized skill sets are improving our knowledge of archaeology. And you brought to my attention a while back Michael R. Frank, who is a expert of a different kind from which we usually talk to on this program. And according to his website, archaeology brought to life with functional replicas of museum artifacts. This is his specialty. And of course, what we're talking about is Occoquan Paleotechnics, which serves the museum community, academic institutions, and all practitioners of traditional skills. Again, being able to hold a uh, -a one-of-a-kind artifact is sometimes a rarity. But when you've got fantastic replicas on hand, that makes it more accessible to all. And how better to learn about these things. So without further ado, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, Michael R. Frank. How are you today? I am great. Thanks for having me on today. Well, I'm really glad that you were able to join us. And, uh, you know, you and Jason have been talking a lot uh, and he has told me all about your work. I'm looking at your site right now. uh, And me personally, especially maybe we'll just say in these kind of unusual times that we're in right now, there is almost this sense of wanting to get back to nature. By that, I mean, you know, camping, but also just uh, those very practical ways of life. And I think the reason for that is that humans have existed this way since time immemorial. And you see that in the incredible kinds of molding and casting representations of artifacts that you produce, uh, which, I mean, they are just, they are beautiful, and yet they teach us so much about these sorts of ancient ways of life. Why don't we talk a little about what you do, how you got into it, and your background in this field? Well, I first got into this when, as a child, my grandmother was giving me archaeology books. I think she wanted to be an archaeologist herself, but back in the 50s and 60s, uh, she was a military wife. I don't know if she was able to pursue that career. And she she saw that I had a passion for it and would continually give me uh, Christmas, birthdays, books on archaeology. And she saw I had this passion and devour it, and she'd uh, foster that. And and that that uh, kept going through, uh, went on through school. I, I had a, developed a plan to go the conventional route and study anthropology in college. And after I uh, graduated with an anthropology degree, I, I was at archaeology field school and saw that they had opportunities at the uh, Smithsonian Museum to uh, volunteer. So I I jumped on that, and I got a job in collections management there for archaeology, and uh, never went back. Uh-huh, yeah. That's just a one-of-a-kind thing. And Jason was telling me, of course, and Jason, maybe you can speak to this, uh, some of the uh, the folks that Michael has worked with, they're, they're not only icons in the field, they're actually sort of, in many ways, um, our heroes, the kinds of guys that lots of people get into this work uh, and who are inspired to study archaeology because of the work that they've done. I know Jason would agree. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, a couple of those uh, masters of the skill, if you would, Dennis Stanford, the late Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley, uh, two, you know, fantastic archaeologists, world-renowned experts that you've had the opportunity to work with. Tell us about your relationship with working with both Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley. Oh, well, that's a good part of the story there. They, When I was in college in an anthropology class, I saw the film of Dennis Stanford testing atlatls into computer targets, and there was talk of his work with, um, I almost said mammoth, with the elephants at the zoo, yeah. where he was able to test atlatl technology and stone technology, and I was fascinated. So that was that was part of the earlier story. When I when I realized there was a chance to volunteer at the mu- same museum where Dennis Stanford works, I knew I wanted to be, I wanted to go that direction. And I, I was able to meet him there and grab any opportunity I could to go on, on digs with Dr. Stanford. And, and we connected right away and he eventually hired me to work for his Paleo Indian program there. Yeah. Again, I think we'd used the expression before the conversation started, trailblazer. Dennis Stanford was one of a kind. Uh, I think he is the very definition in many ways of the maverick because he was both one of the most respected uh, in the field of paleoanthropology and also someone who was comfortable, I think, going into the more uncomfortable areas of thought in relation to this and at times, you know, also courted controversy. Uh, he was someone who, in other words, really thought outside of the box and had a incredible and impressive working knowledge of the Paleolithic traditions uh, in North America and also other parts of the world. But coming back to the work that you do, and again, I want to say right here as we're having the conversation, ladies and gents, that uh, we are uh, fortunate enough to have Michael and what he's telling us about today uh, sponsoring some of what we do. And we want to try and, of course, promote in any way the kind of work that he does, which is not limited only to artifact molding and casting, but also primitive tech and uh, throwing technologies. Uh, let's talk a little about what you do and what you offer there at your website. Well, you know, I thought of a great example of uh, primitive te- primitive tech instead of um, not only uh, molding and casting. Um, one of the th- moments that sparked my business was uh, when a neighbor was taking an anthropology class and at a local community college, and I asked to see the textbook, and she had a picture of of a flint core, and the side on a page in the book, and. Uh, it was a grainy picture. You couldn't see the flake scars. And I asked her, honestly, is that, um, are you able to see what that is? Does that mean anything to you? And she started laughing. <laughs> like, uh, honestly, Mike, that's that looks like just a rock. That's a rock. I don't know what that is. And I went home and got a flint core uh, that I'd prepared with uh, blades and showed her how the blade detached from the core and the light bulb sort of went off. She's like, oh, well, okay, that's what I'm looking at. But it wasn't fully there. Then I held up a piece of leather and used the blade to cut leather. And then the light bulb went off. She, She's, oh, that's what, okay. And it, it related to something in her everyday life, the um, scissors we have in the house and things that we, we use. And that's when I realized that uh, the business wouldn't be just for academics uh, writing papers for peer review, but for everybody, uh, archaeology is for the, the public. And I I wanted to see, so it wasn't just the molding and casting, the, the primitive technology side uh, can really bring archaeology out of the books and, and to life for for all of everybody interested in archaeology. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really a way to, to make things tangible and relatable for people. I, I couldn't tell you how many times this guy, Jason Pentrail, and I have been sitting there at his kitchen table He's like, okay, Micah, look at this. Okay, now put your hand here, feel that. Uh, look at this, the way that this flake was removed off of this surface. You know, what do you think this is for? What does this do? What's the functionality of this? And, you know, you learn by studying and being hands on with it. And again, uh, I have learned so much from being around people like Jason. And he, of course, has on hand a lot of these sorts of uh, castings and these representations of some of those kind of game changers, actually often from the type sites uh, in archaeology. And again, it really does put you in the mindset of, oh, I'm holding this. I'm able to turn it in my hands and see it in three dimensions. Now I know what property this you know, had, what the purpose was, what this meant to the person who used it. Yes, that's wonderful. That's exactly what uh, what we're trying to do here. Yeah, and and... 
as a matter of fact, I often use when we have live appearances, we have live podcasts, I actually use many of your casts and I put them right out there on the table so that people coming by can touch a famous artifact. Children can pick them up and handle them without the fear of breaking a priceless artifact uh, or even a really well-made reproduction. But the casts have been uh, monumental to drawing people to the Seven Ages table. So therefore, we've actually been working together for quite a long time now. Uh, unannounced to you, the business owner, but I have been using your products. And I myself have actually had a Paleo Point cast by Akuquan Paleo Technics. And I got to say that the uh, level of expertise was outstanding. The color was matched perfectly and I couldn't have been happier with the result. So as our sponsor uh, for the next uh, several shows, I would like to say personally, I've used the product. The product is top notch. And I couldn't be happier with my own interactions with Aquaquan Paleotechnics. Well, thank you, Jason. That's that's good to hear. It's, um, casting has, you know, several uses, several benefits to all the different levels of interest that we have in the past. Uh, the the need to have an object at the table that people can can pick up that that might not always be available with with the original artifact. The uh, your former guest, Dr. Bradley, he. He takes casts on on travel uh, of the new some of the the new pieces that are coming out of let's say the Chesapeake Bay some of the uh, the the really early sites that he, he's not able to take the originals around to uh, ar other archaeologists around the world and 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 explain what's what kind of amazing things are coming out but the the cast can um, they can easily be thrown thrown in your suitcase thrown in a in your pocket, if you want, or on the table, and everybody will have access to that information. Yes, I mean that is so important. Again, it is difficult at times to take a priceless, you know, artifact, you know, especially if it, it belongs in a museum collection or if it is, you know, in a private collection in association with a university, you know, and it is a piece that is uh, for study. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to go to the university, make an appointment, speak with an expert, but it's a very different thing to be able to take that out of that environment and risk, of course, damage, uh, whereas having that skillfully made replica, uh, which actually, in terms of the replica process, we should talk a little about that. We're not just talking about the same general shape. We're talking about the color, uh, the texture. You know, uh, if we're talking about a, a substance like obsidian, uh, the replica is going to have uh, the same sort of translucence around the edges as you would expect from a glass-like uh, stone like obsidian. Let's let's talk a little about how you, you nail down those similarities when you're creating a spot-on replica of these sorts of artifacts. Well, it's an art and a science both. The, the art might be in getting some of the colors right, um, that matches that might match it up with its raw material, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the the science part is mostly in the silicone, the new modern silicones that make a molecular sheet of the surface, and that's something that three D printers are nowhere near uh, up to yet. They're um, uh, they might be someday, but they're not, but not yet. The um, so the new silicones can pick up even microscopic use wear. On and you mentioned obsidian. Let's say the, the glassiness of obsidian. If I if I were to uh, put a different color in there and make it brown, it would just look like brown obsidian. It wouldn't look like flint. It would be glassy and uh, it picks up the the texture and uh, and you swear on the edge too. Yeah, that, that's just so interesting to me. The way that there is cutting edge technology being utilized to create these replicas that are unlike anything that you'll ever expect to see. Uh, Although few do uh, when they are actually out there in the field and they discover the original, the, the genuine article. But again, this is the next, literally the very next best thing. And in many ways, there are even more benefits to these replicas. Now, the website, which we will have linked in the show notes there at our website, uh, is occpaleo.com. That's the letter occpaleo.com. And, of course, we want folks to go to the website. And is there a way that they can get in touch with you directly, Michael, if they have questions about things that you offer there at your site? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. The My email address is on. It should be uh, linked on the bottom of every page on that website. You can email me directly. I, I'm on there every day. I love to talk about it, and uh, I love questions. So that's Clovis23 at Comcast.net. That's... 
I want to make that as much available as I can. Um, that's that's the whole purpose of the business, to talk to people and get that out. That's true, yes. And we thank you for talking with us today. And on that note of communication, I see also there's a newsletter at your website that people can sign up for and can get information about your uh, operations there. So again, Aquaquan Paleotechnics, LLC, bringing archaeology to life. That website again is occpaleo.com. And Michael, I want to thank you again for jumping here on the mic with us on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. And I should also mention that Michael was truly generous enough uh, to offer a discount for listeners of this show. If you go to his website there, occpaleo.com, you will be able to get a 20% discount if you enter the offer code, the number 7 ages. So it's 7 ages, number 7, A-G-E-S, and that is all caps, 7 ages, all caps. Uh, Enter that offer code when you're checking out there. And you will get that very generous discount. And if your business is interested in sponsoring the Seven Ages Audio Journal, please contact Jason Pentrell at jason at sevenages.org. Excellent. We certainly want to hear from you and see what we can do to help you out. And uh, now shifting gears in the direction of our broader conversation on this episode. Uh, Jason, you and I lately have uh, been uh, having many conversations both on and off the mic and uh With some of the series and things that we have had planned, uh, it has felt like just a continuing bucket list uh, series of conversations and uh, those who we've already spoken to and some that we have in the coming weeks. Today, I think it's safe to say we have one of those because there has been a lot of discussion in the archaeological community about a paper that was recently published about the Abu Huraira site in Syria. When we were recently there at the White Pond dig site, this discussion was ongoing throughout the weekend, and we had actually had an opportunity to speak with some of the co-authors of that paper over the telephone, and it had been suggested you guys should speak to Andrew M.T. Moore, who was the lead author of that paper. Now, Jason, you and I have followed his work for a long time. I believe it was first James Kennett who had put... Uh, his name out to us. I remember immediately going and reading some of the papers he had written about early agriculture. And he is such a remarkable archaeologist, not just for the diversity of the sorts of sites that he has worked with, but he is also a past president, and therefore his actual title now is Honorary President of the Archaeological Institute of America. But what a guy to talk with and about this groundbreaking new study coming out of Syria. Yeah, this study and this particular conversation was absolutely fascinating. Now, this is the third installment of our Younger Dryas Impact series. Uh, This one comes quickly on the heels of our last conversation with Dr. Chris Moore and and Dr. Malcolm LeCompte. Um, However, the uh, importance of this paper uh, is what has led to the third episode being released so close to the last one. But... uh, absolutely fascinating and i think this is one of the most important details uh as far as sites go uh, as far as the impact of the the actual younger dryas event uh what we're going to discuss in here is absolutely mind-blowing and i have to say this is one of the most interesting conversations we've had in a very long time so let's get right into it then andrew mt moore is our guest this week on the seven ages audio journal Tonight is a unique experience here for the Seven Ages team. We are joined by Andrew Moore, Honorary President of the Archaeological Institute of America, recently retired from Rochester Institute of Technology. He also taught European and world archaeology at the University of Arizona and Yale University. And he has long participated in archaeological surveys, excavations, and field research in countries as wide and varied as England, Italy, Malta, Croatia, Greece, Turkey, Israel... And of course, Syria. His earlier research concentrated on the advent of agriculture and sedentary life in Western Asia, especially in Syria. 
And beginning in the early 2000s, he began investigations into the spread of farming around the Mediterranean and into southern Europe, something we'll certainly be talking with him about. But Dr. Moore is also the lead author of a recent paper that appeared in Scientific Reports, which presents evidence of a cosmic impact at Abu Huraira, Syria, at the Younger Dryas onset. Can't wait to have this conversation with you. And welcome to the program, Dr. Andrew Moore. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, it is truly a pleasure. You spent much of your early career studying the beginnings of agriculture in Western Asia and other locales. Was it this research that first brought you to Syria? Yes, it was. Um, I was looking into the early stages of farming and particularly the Neolithic cultures. Uh, and those were the ones um, that sort of represented this early farming stage. But back in the early 1970s, when I started my research, we knew something about the Neolithic period uh, in the southern Levant, in the Jordan Valley. I think particularly of the site of Jericho, which was dug by my mentor, Kathleen Kenyon. Uh, but so far as the northern Levant was concerned, uh, what is now the country of Syria, stretching all the way across to northern Iraq, we had very little information indeed. So when I started my research, that looked like a key area to explore. Yes. Now, the excavations began at Abu Huraira some time ago. Uh, I do want to ask, how did you first become involved with the archaeological work at that location? Um, the beginning of it all really came uh, as a result of an invitation from the Syrian authorities. Uh, the Syrian government was building a dam across the, um, the river at a little town called Tabka, just upriver from Raqqa, which I think many of your listeners will uh, know about because it's been in so much in the news recently. And this was going to flood 50 miles of the valley of the Euphrates River. Well, this was terra incognita so far as archaeologists were concerned. So they invited um, many archaeologists from overseas to join them in investigating the uh, the, the sites in the valley bottom before they were drowned. Uh, so I went there in 1971, um, looked at uh, early Neolithic sites up and down the valley. There were just a few of them. Abu Huraira was by far the most uh, promising. So we put in a request to excavate that site and we dug it in 1972 and 1973. And then in 1974, the sluice gates of the dam were closed and our site disappeared 10 days later. Oh, yes, indeed. Nature sometimes intervenes. Uh, I know Jason wants to go back a little bit and talk about the agriculture and the studies with regard to the rise of agriculture. I think that's fundamental to our understanding of all this. But as we are mentioning those early days, 1972, 1973, Dr. Moore, I have to ask right here at the outset, uh, at what point were the impact proxies that began to be associated with the onset of the YD, the Younger Dryas, that is, when were they recovered and identified? Were they recovered as early as those first excavations? Yes, they were in yeah. 1972 and in 1973 during the dig. Um, you see, we decided to excavate Abu Huraira as though it were a research excavation, although we were operating under salvage conditions. And so we paid particular attention to recovering economic evidence, animal bones and charred plant remains, um, using special, special techniques. Uh, and in addition, I saved uh, a series of soil samples from several of the key uh, trenches not expecting to study them immediately, we put them on one side, thinking that um, perhaps at a later stage, as new techniques were developed, it would be useful to go back and look at those uh, soil samples. Well, 40 years passed, and then suddenly <laughs> um, an opportunity came to look at those soil samples again. And that was what led uh, to these uh, discoveries that are uh, discussed in the Nature paper. Awful glad that we had those on hand all these years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, forward thinking at its best. I mean, uh, and we do that so often in this, this discipline is, you know, saving things for future research. So uh, I would like to start with general description of the size and the scope. Um, where is it you know, located exactly? How big is it? How much work was done uh, at the site before uh, it was flooded out? And then um, if we can, maybe kind of compare it to what we would expect from a, a type of mound site here in North America, because that's what most of our listeners are used to seeing. So size and scope of the site, uh, how big is it? 
Well, let's um, let's just talk about the location first. Then we'll get to the specifics of the the size. Um, <clears throat> if you look at a map of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, you will see that um, uh, Syria has a short uh, coastline uh, these days. And um, as you study the physical topography of that part of the world, you'll notice particularly the Euphrates River, which rises in northeastern Turkey and then flows southwest. And as it comes across the Turkish border, it's within 200 kilometers, 100, 150 miles of the Mediterranean coast. So if you go due east from the Mediterranean coast, past the city of Aleppo, which has also been in the news recently, uh, in very unhappily, uh, you will reach the Euphrates River. Uh, so this is the point on the Euphrates that is closest to the Mediterranean. Then the river turns southeast, flows all the way down through Syria and Iraq to the Persian Gulf. But it's at that bend in the middle section of the Euphrates that Abu Huraira is located. Now, if we think a little bit more about um, its precise position in the landscape, if we focus in, as it were, then the Euphrates is a very wide um, river valley, uh, several miles across at that point. And then, of course, you come to a series of terraces. And at our site, Abu Huraira, was located on the initial terrace, the first terrace, just above the floodplain of the river, so that you could step off the site down into the floodplain if you went in one direction. But if you turned uh, in the other direction, then you had the open landscape of uh, the interior of Syria behind you. So this was a, a crucial uh, location um, <clears throat> on, or, and obviously, a route up and down the river valley and with access to two zones, the valley bottom and the open countryside uh, behind. Uh, the site itself, when we went to see it, was extraordinarily large, 11 and a half hectares. That's over 30 acres in uh, extent. And considering that the site goes back 13,000 years, um, that's a huge uh, site. But most of what we um, we saw uh, were the remains of an early Neolithic uh, village. Um, there were no there was no pottery on the surface, just um, uh, immense quantities of flints and flint tools. So we knew from the flint tools their um, their configuration uh, that we were dealing with a site that dated at least from the early Neolithic, and there was a chance, of course, that there would be earlier levels underneath. Well, what we did not expect, but we found at the end of the first season of excavation, was that indeed there was an earlier village underneath the remains of the Neolithic village that we'd come to excavate, and this dated from the Epipaleolithic, or hunting and gathering uh, stage. And so we learned very early on that we had an opportunity here to study not just the last hunters and gatherers and the first farmers, but probably the transition from hunting and gathering to farming. And that's what made the site so uh, interesting to us and so important archaeologically. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and so going back, we're talking 13,000 years before present. So going back, uh, just to paint the picture for the listeners, because I want everyone to really be able to envision the site, uh, what do we think the environment uh, at the locality would have looked like 13,000 years ago compared to how it looks today? Well, right back then, we were in the, the, the end of the last uh, ice age, and uh, conditions were already warming up. Uh, there was more rainfall in the region than there is today. So today, when you go to Abu Huraira, it's a bare step, um, a really open landscape with not much vegetation uh, at all. It appears to be almost desert-like. That's partly because humans have really destroyed what was left of the natural vegetation. But back then, at the end of the last ice age, uh, the site sat in open woodland, an open park woodland with scattered oak and uh, pistachio trees uh, and grassland in between the in between uh, the the forest, as it were, the open forest. And then the vegetation in the valley bottom uh, near the Euphrates River would have been very thick indeed with uh, tamarisk uh, trees, um, immense banks of reeds. Um, 
and uh, and marsh vegetation as well. So this was a very rich uh, area indeed, which of course was what attracted humans to the place in, uh, in to begin with. But the other crucial thing about the site was, as we discovered, it lay on a gazelle migration route. Gazelle would uh, spend the winters farther uh, south in the interior of Syria. And then in the spring, they would move, move north in search of fresh uh, pasture, going right by, or walking right by the site of Abu Huraira. And we believe that was why this site was established at that particular location. It was the attraction of the gazelle migration route. They could slaughter these animals in great quantities on the spring migration, dry the meat and save it for consumption later in the year. Ah. Oh. Yeah, you know that makes perfect sense when you when you look at the uh, the position uh, of the site. Now, as far as um, that earliest site, were you able to glean any sort of uh, indication as to population numbers? Do we have any idea of how many people we may have been looking at? Uh, really, it has to be a guesstimate, but because um, we excavated just forty nine square meters of this site, and we had to dig through five meters of overburden to get to it, so. Um, uh, you know, we have a, a, a little window into this early village. We excavated part of several hut, um, subterranean, semi-subterranean uh, pit dwellings, um, uh, little um, hollows cut into the uh, subsoil, uh, and several of these would be joined together, roofed over with timber and reeds to make individual houses or huts, if you like. And we excavated parts of two or three of those. My um, guesstimate was that each of these would have would have held a sort of nuclear nuclear family, um, but then if you looked at um, uh, if you extended uh, the area that we excavated and looked a little bit uh, beyond, we're probably dealing with a settlement of. Um, 10, 20 uh, houses, maybe a population of uh, um, 200 people, something like that, one to 200 people. Yeah, fairly small. But then again, of course, this was long ago. As far as lithic distribution, uh, if you were to compare the, again, the temporal area that we're discussing right now with the Abu Huraira excavations, does lithic material and other evidence at the site compare to other sites in terms of population? In other words, can you glean information about population in this period relative to excavations at other sites? I think you can, but uh, please understand that these are guesstimates, not um, accurate uh, calculations. Uh, Abu Huraira was obviously a more substantial um, village uh, at its in its prime in this very early hunting and gathering stage, and we're back 13,000, 13,500 years ago. Um, uh, but the key thing that we discovered from the plant and animal remains that was all, that it was already a sedentary settlement. In other words, people were living there year round. Uh -huh. And that argues for a slightly larger population than if we were just dealing with hunters and gatherers who were on the move every right. few weeks. Now, when you look um, more broadly in this part of the world, and particularly in the southern Levant, uh, most of the sites of this uh, age would have been small hunter and gatherer encampments, um, much smaller than we think uh, the little village at uh, Abu Huraira probably was. There are a few um, settlements which seem to have been more permanent in nature, and those are the ones that I would compare Abu Huraira with, and they certainly had populations of um, several score people, uh, maybe as many as a hundred. I think at Abu Huraira we're dealing with a slightly larger community than that, and that's because the um, circumstances uh, of its location were unique, uh, and particularly uh, this location on the gazelle migration route would have supported a slightly larger sedentary hunting and gathering population than other sites in the region. Ah, got it. Dr. Moore, in, in regards to the lithic materials, what were the what were the types of materials and what were the source materials uh, that were found at the site? Well, it was a microlithic uh, industry, very distinctive and very well known uh, and quite characteristic of this time uh, um, in uh, that region of the Middle East. So, you know, immediately we started excavating those levels. I recognized some of the characteristic uh, flint tools, in particular little lunates or crescent-shaped um, microliths that would have been hafted uh, to make um, uh, arrowheads, 
um, uh, particularly maybe harpoons, uh, tools of that kind, also uh, cutting cutting instruments. Um, so uh, the, the, there was nothing particularly special about the industry. It was quite characteristic of its time and place. Uh, and even before we had the radiocarbon dates, we were able to say, right, uh, you know, we know roughly where in time and space um, we are. In addition, there were grinding tools. Uh, now, well, you ask where the, did the flints come from? Um, the source material was to be found up and down the Euphrates Valley uh, because uh, the river cuts through beds of chalky uh, miles with horizontal deposits of flints uh, within them. So you only had to walk a few or hardly a kilometer or two from the site in order to find uh, perfectly good um, uh, sources of uh, flints uh, to use for uh, artifacts. The grinding tools, on the other hand, of which there were plenty, um, were rather different. Most of them were made of basalt. And there are basalt flows in northern Syria, but not uh, near Abu Huraira. So you would have had to t take a journey, perhaps uh, walked uh, a, a day's distance off into the uh, woodland uh, behind the site in order to um, arrive at the nearest sources of basalt. Uh, and there they obviously broke off chunks uh, of this stuff and brought it back and fashioned it in, probably they, they actually they fashioned the uh, rough outs of the tools at the sources of basalt. That's very heavy stuff to carry around. And then they brought the, the semi worked out tools back to uh, the site. Those were the two main classes of stone tools. And then in addition, we had um, uh, bone tools and a fairly rich uh, bone industry, um, and then other small um, artifacts uh, made out of uh, stones um, just carried up from the gravels along the edge of the Euphrates River. Yes, this is all fascinating, being able to put together the pieces and assemble this image of what life was like at Abu Huraira so long ago. Now, in the recent study... Part of what you and your co-authors are looking at are these impact proxies that are roughly, actually, more or less perfectly align with what we understand is the onset of the Younger Dryas boundary. Let's talk a little about the varieties of things, maybe beginning first with uh, the maximum temperatures and potential origins of the Younger Dryas boundary melt glass. There are a variety of ways that melt glass can be formed in nature. Can we first go over some of those? Uh, welcome, you are welcome to uh, explore that. So we'll, we'll, we'll go in that direction. In the paper, what we look at are, of course, biomass burning, lightning strikes. The uh, obvious implication, of course, is that some of the melt glass that we are seeing at Abu Huraira is evidence of an impact. But some critics have argued, well, these other natural or terrestrial uh, mechanisms might account for this. Now, the paper lays out pretty good reasons why other sources, particularly lightning strikes, are unlikely to be the causal component behind the melt glass we are talking about. So what do we kind of lay out in the paper and how, how do we come to this conclusion that an impact, an extraterrestrial impact, is the most likely causal agent with relation to the melt glass samples and proxies that are studied? Well, let's let's think of for a moment about um, how the melt glass occurred. How did we find it in the first place? Because um, this is mainly um, the the melt glass appeared as those uh, soil samples were investigated by Alan West and the rest of the team. Um, and what they did, obviously, was to take samples uh, of the the soil that I gave them and put it under, put them under the microscope, particularly electron microscopes. And what they found at um, microscopic levels was traces of this melt glass. Well, not just um, you know a melt glass on uh, bits of um, anonymous soil, they actually found that the melt glass had splattered on little bits of bone, from, probably from those gazelle hunts, and also on little bits of clay that had been used as building material, again, probably to seal the walls of those timber and reed huts. Uh -huh. So we had a direct association there between the splattering of the melt glass on basically human artifacts. 
So this is not, you know, this cannot be a natural phenomenon. Um, um, it, it's, it's very closely associated with the human activities on the site. And I think that's one of the most striking uh, aspects of all of this. But as you say, um, you know, melt glass can be formed in a, a number of ways. And so it was important as part of the background research for this paper to explore all the um, possible ways in which the melt glass occurs could have formed. And the key thing was the background uh, temperature. Now, we had found uh, other materials, little um, carbon spherules and so on, which are not uncommon on sites where there's been heavy burning. Right. And yes, they could be the result of, shall we say, natural fires in the in the vicinity, um, burning at uh, somewhat in excess of 1,000 degrees centigrade. So we knew that we were right up there with temperature, but would that be enough um, for the melt glass? Could it just be um, uh, there as a result of a wildfire, something of, of that kind? Um, well, it really didn't look like that because many of the minerals that were identified in the um, in the melt glass turned out to have much higher melting temperatures, as high as 2,000 degrees centigrade and beyond. Wow. So in order to create the melt glass that we had at Abu Huraira in those soil samples, you had to have heat generated of up to and beyond 2,000 degrees centigrade. Now, that's extraordinarily hot, far beyond um, what you would find um, in wildfires sweeping through that open woodland that I mentioned uh, a little while ago. Even if, uh, you know, a campfire had simply um, blown out of control and burnt the huts down, that would not have generated enough ha um, heat to melt the quartz grains, for, its in for instance, or the zirconium uh, grains that we found in those melt glass uh, uh, samples. So something clearly um, very unusual had taken place uh, here indeed. And then in addition to the melt glass, we found traces of other um, uh, remarkable uh, elements, in particular platinum, which is turned up in the Greenland uh, ice cores and in other YDB uh, locations. Mm -hmm. So this indicated, and the platinum is just not part of the uh, normal background geology here in the Euphrates Valley. Right. So, you know, the platinum had to come from somewhere else. So we had the very high temperatures of the melt glass, the occurrence of the, the platinum, uh, which had to have uh, an extraterrestrial source in uh, our locality uh, because there is none in the background geology, it was clear that something very unusual here um, had taken place uh, indeed. And all of this fitted best with uh, the um, hypothesis that uh, there had indeed be the Earth had indeed uh, collided with an extraterrestrial um, object uh, that was probably breaking up um, uh, as this collision took place. And then there had been an air burst. Uh, not something that would necessarily leave a crater or a sort of mark on the surface of the ground, but an air burst very near to Abu Huraira that would have generated enormous uh, sudden uh, heat uh, sufficient to melt um, part of the sub subsoil and therefore generate this melt glass that then was spattered on the bones, um, on other pieces of stone, and on the bits of clay that we think had been used as um, housing or uh, house building materials. Yes, tremendously energetic event we're talking about here. And Dr. Moore, would I be correct in suggesting that the mineral inclusions that you're discussing in the melt glass from Abu Huraira are essentially one of the most significant clues in the sense that for their presence to be accounted for, we had to have these extreme temperatures you're describing? That's the key thing. Um, so th this is uh, this is quite beyond what you would ex expect through normal natural uh, phenomena. Um, it's simply not possible to think of um, other ways in which this melt glass could have occurred. You know, others have suggested, well, what about volcanism? Right. Um, certainly, there has been um, volcano activity in Syria um, within uh, the geological recent past, but not in this part of the Euphrates Valley. So that won't uh, that that explanation simply um, will not bear up. Others have said, well, perhaps lightning strikes, which would um, generate. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, similar uh, similar sorts of uh, conditions. Well, there are uh, very good scientific reasons um, why lightning uh, really wouldn't work um, for uh, what we found at um, Abu Huraira. So, you know, if you eliminate all the other possible ways in which milk glass could have been generated, you're left with this one admittedly extraordinary um, explanation, uh, and that is uh, an extraterrestrial event. Right. Dr. Moore, looking at the situation as it lies with the description that you've just given, uh, is there any way to determine how close the airburst may have been to the site based off the splatter marks or based off the amount of melt glass present at the site? You really have to uh, make an estimate there, but um, you can go uh, to other um, places on the Earth's surface where similar uh, events uh, have occurred. Um, after all, uh, there are plenty of meteor craters around, including the meteor crater in um, uh, in the uh, southwest in Arizona. Uh, and one of the other places that we've gone for comparative material is the site of the Trinity nuclear explosion that, of course, started the atomic uh, age um, in uh, New Mexico. And we have compared our melt glass and some of the other samples that we've recovered with what you find on the ground at the Trinity site and indeed uh, at a Meteor Crater. And if you um, do those comparisons, you come to the conclusion that the um, airburst at Abu Huraira must have occurred very close to the site indeed, perhaps not immediately overhead, because that probably would have obliterated all the archaeological material, um, and there would have been nothing for us to find, but uh, certainly within just a kilometer or two. So this was, um, this was very close to the site. Uh, and it had a devastating effect. We know now um, that the site was uh, completely destroyed. I found evidence for this at the time that we were excavating. There was a burned level um, in these uh, deposits that sealed off uh, the earliest hunting and gathering village uh, remains. But of course, um, comets uh, and extraterrestrial events were very far from my thinking at uh, that time in 1973 when I was excavating uh, the site. I thought that these were simply cooking fires because they seemed to be in association with the, the pit dwellings that we were um, excavating. And that seemed to be the most rational um, uh, explanation at the time. Right. Heavy burning, uh, probably the remains of generations of cooking fires, and that was as far as I went with my thinking. Um, but of course, it was those soil samples that we saved, uh, and um, uh, uh, the opportunity to examine them uh, much more carefully and uh, just ju just recently uh, that uh, has um, allowed us to align Abu Huraira with this uh, extraordinary um, impact uh, event. Dr. Moore, uh, in regards to the melt glass, um, you know, melt glass can form in a lot of, lot of different ways. Um, but the but nearly all the fragments of melt glass that were found at the site that were at least larger than several millimeters in size float on water. So what does that indicate uh, uh, about the about the formation of, of the melt glass and and uh, and the other interior features that are present? Uh, simply, I think that we're dealing with um, a sudden event that sort of vaporized um, the the soil, generated enormous heat. But what we find when we look at these um, uh, li uh, little specks, if you like, little um, samples of melt glass, is that um, uh, while they were melted totally on the um, outside of each of the, the droplets, if you like, uh, that wasn't completely the case uh, on the, the inside. So the exterior of these little fragments of melt glass got extremely hot. But this was a very sudden event that passed within a, a matter of seconds. And then everything immediately began to um, cool down. So you get evidence of... Um, short distance flows, if you like. Uh, but um, uh, then everything seems to have cooled off extremely uh, quickly. And one of the interesting examples of this is that some of the melt glass and some of the other uh, residues that we found that we associate now with this uh, impact uh, event actually uh, contain the impressions of plants, particularly reeds that were growing in the valley bottom. And I think what, what was happening was that this material, this melted material, got splattered on reeds that formed 
and, and part of the roofing and perhaps the walls of our pit dwellings. And um, as this stuff cooled, it preserved the uh, imprints of the, the, the plant remains um, uh, inside. And we've done um, experiments now um, using modern um, equivalents of the, these reeds, these phragmites um, reeds, uh, just to see how they, they, they would have uh, uh, formed. And we have, we've heated them right up um, uh, to the point at which they disappear as ash, and we've thrown uh, a potential uh, uh, melted glass uh, at them just to see um, how, if, if you can replicate in the laboratory what seems to have happened at Abu Huraira. This is discussed at some length in the in the paper, and it turns out you can replicate the uh, these precise conditions. And again, you've got to get up to 17, 1800 degrees centigrade to generate the kinds of heat that um, uh, melts uh, the glass in the the first place, coats these plant stems, if you like, and then you have to have this uh, phenomenon of sudden cooling immediately afterwards to preserve the uh, traces of the plant remains without burning them up completely. So in regards to uh, the melt glass, in the paper, you spend a, a fair amount of time talking about reflectance values of that material. And what's the mm -hmm. significance of that? Um, I think you'd have to ask Alan West uh, and one or two of the other scientists for a more detailed explanation than I can give you of that particular phenomenon. Um, I defer to their scientific expertise uh, when it comes to you know some of these particular details of the science that's involved. Certainly. And, you know, we actually uh, did have an opportunity off the microphone to speak with Alan West recently, and he was the very one who told us, you guys got to talk to Dr. Moore, but it just goes to show what a cumulative effort it is. Uh, you know, I do want to touch on something with relation uh, quickly to the idea of lightning strikes as an alternative hypothesis here, because one of the key elements that was employed by the research team and the co-authors of this paper had been remnant magnetism, mm -hmm. which seems to help differentiate the tectite formations in question. Can we talk a little about that? Yes, give it a go. Sure. So the remnant magnetism, as I understand it, what, what's happening here is that there is a much faster and hotter mechanism by which lightning strikes form tectites than would be expected in a widespread impact event. The team, correct me if I'm wrong, tested for the possibility that lightning strikes could account for this, but they are not consistent. In other words, the melt glass there at Abu Huraira was not consistent with lightning strike formations based on the remnant magnetism. Is that a decent summary of how this kind of went down? Yes, it is. This is one of the um, criteria, if you like, that uh, distinguishes um, uh, lightning strikes from um, the evidence that we that we found, um, and I think you know, it's just hard to see from a, just a practical point of view um, how a lightning strike would create any of the other phenomena that um, we found as um, we were investigating these soil samples. But as I think back, you know, to um, the excavation itself. We were dealing there, this, this burning was on a much larger scale than you would expect from something as, um, as uh, uh, straightforward, if you like, uh, as a lightning strike. There's no doubt, of course, that lightning strikes occur in uh, Syria. Uh, they've occurred in the past and they still occur today. But they're not going to have uh, the impact um, that, that we found. And from um, a scientific point of view, uh, the uh, touching on the the remnant ma magnetism in particular, uh, what we found was simply not consistent with uh, a lightning strike. And so this is one of the reasons why we were able to set that potential explanation on one side. Right. Dr. Moore, I've got some more really technical questions here. And if you got to defer to the uh, other authors, I totally understand. Um, but in regards to the mineralogical aspects of the of the melt glass, mm -hmm. specifically within with regards to melted melted iron silicides, there was a very specific mineral that was detected, which is very rare. Uh, it's called susite. Um, yep. I don't know if you could comment on that and how it makes this site a little more specific as far as uh, as regards to uh, a cosmic impactor. 
Well, I think it was not just uh, the silicite, but there were several other uh, minerals that re really were not part of the background background geology. So then the question comes, and you know, I've already mentioned the, the platinum, which I think is the key one. Mm -hmm. uh, the question then is, you know, where does this stuff come from? Um, uh, and improbable though it may seem, um, it really uh, turns out that um, uh, extraterrestrial bodies, uh, really the most part, looking to them as the source of these materials, these elements, um, really, uh, these minerals, um, really is the most parsimonious uh, explanation. Uh, now, uh, the the weight of scientific opinion is uh, is leaning towards a, a comet um, as being the source of these materials. But we've also looked very hard at meteorites and asteroids because each of them uh, are capable of um, yielding uh, rare uh, minerals that um, uh, could could be scattered, you know, across the the surface uh, of the ground um, had there been uh, uh, an impact um, or collision with one or other of those um, those uh, items, if you like. Uh, but it seems less likely now that uh, we're dealing with a meteorite um, or uh, an asteroid, and more likely that we're dealing with debris from uh, a comet that was perhaps breaking up as it um, as, as it uh, met the uh, the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, so while that is not, I think, a settled question yet, uh, a lot more science needs to be done, that seems to be where the evidence is taking us at the moment. And I'll just briefly add here and then toss it to you, Jason, that, again, when we talk about all of the different proxies and all of the different potential extraterrestrial components to this, in addition to platinum, we also have, of course, the presence of iridium. Some of these are actually, I believe, inclusive in the melt glass structure itself. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. the very unique presence of a rare earth phosphate, I believe, monazite. Uh, I found that particularly interesting because I don't recall seeing that in much of the other literature. And there are a lot of elements here that, to borrow your own wording, Dr. Moore, it may seem rather novel to propose an extraterrestrial impact. But again, if that is, as you said, the most parsimonious explanation in this case, and especially in a way that can account for the abundance of sites, very similar sites around the globe on multiple continents that show similar proxies, then we really need to go with what that evidence seems to be pointing to. And it really, I have to say, this paper uh, makes that case stronger than ever, in my opinion. Jason, I'm sorry, go ahead there. Yeah, well, I mean, and I want to take a moment here for the listeners and please encourage you to please go to the journal Nature, look at this paper, read it for yourself. It is certainly full of information and a lot of very detailed uh, scientific analysis. It's something you really should read for yourself. But returning again to the importance of the site itself, uh, we have a long standing archaeological site that's spanning many time periods, many generations. So again, I want to talk about the importance of having a site where you can actually see a transition from a hunter-gatherer uh, culture into the world of agriculture. So with that in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the stratigraphy of the site, uh, the time uh, distance between where we see the hunter-gatherer um, indication versus where we see the onset of agriculture. So we, we've hit on that a little bit at the beginning of the conversation, but just to clarify, um, c let's talk about the stratigraphy of the site. And again, when do we see the onset of agriculture at Abu Herrera? Okay, so the site was um, first settled around about 13,500 uh, years ago by this uh, little community of uh, hunters and gatherers. We have this um, little community of hunters and gatherers, 100, 200 strong, something like that, living in their um, uh, semi-subterranean pit dwellings on the edge of the Euphrates River uh, and conducting um, a very standard hunting and gathering um, uh, um, um, way of life, though it had this these very distinctive characteristics, uh, with the uh, uh, the opportunity to hunt gazelle and so on on a seasonal on a seasonal basis, um, and then something happened, and all those years ago uh, we were um, very clear in our minds that there was um, 
a, a distinct change in the nature of the settlement. Uh, on top of the uh, the pit dwellings, there was a level of above ground huts. I could see the clay floors in the soil as we excavated, um, <clears throat> and uh, enough to tell us that we were now dealing with above ground uh, dwellings. But there was no real change in the artifacts, except that there were perhaps rather fewer grinding stones. Uh, but the the flint tools remained uh, much the same. But there was a change in the configuration of the uh, settlement. Uh, and then in time, uh, this early village seems to have morphed into something altogether more substantial, where the houses um, had several rooms in them. Uh, they were built of mud bricks, and they were rectilinear um, uh, in shape. So whereas the pit dwellings have been subcircular, uh, the houses of this much larger Neolithic settlement um, were uh, uh, made of mud brick. Uh, and of course, mud um, is abundant in the uh, Euphrates Valley. They had a rich source of for raw material to use. And it's really the remains of that later village, uh, which we now know was um, inhabited by uh, farmers, uh, that made up the bulk of the enormous uh, um, quantity of deposits that we found on the mound. Um, this mound um, stood eight meters at its highest point above the above the subsoil. So we were dealing with a very long-lived settlement, one that went through a number of stages, but occupation was continuous. As the radiocarbon dates came in, they told us that the occupation was continuous from start to finish. There was no break in the archaeological or stratigraphic sequence even though the village itself um, had changed uh, its appearance uh, through time. Now, <clears throat> I'd said that we uh, one objective of the excavation was to recover large quantities of animal bones and plant remains, which uh, um, indeed we did. And we were able to export those from Syria and bring them back to England at that stage where uh, they still happily reside. But of course, it takes you 10, 20 years to um, <clears throat> get your team to look at these materials and come up with uh, an explanation of what they represent. So we had the stratigraphic, stratigraphic evidence at the end of the excavation. We knew how the settlement had changed uh, its look uh, through time, but we didn't know what that represented in human terms and certainly not in economic terms. Well, by the mid-80s, we were beginning to get a fairly clear sense of how this might have played out. And it turned out that the um, switch from pit dwellings to above ground dwellings coincided exactly with the transition from pure hunting and gathering to the earlier stages of farming with some continued uh, hunting and gathering. Furthermore, we were able to link that to a dramatic change in the vegetation around the site. So apparently overnight, that open woodland that I talked about at the beginning turned into an extremely dry steppe uh, with just a kind of open grassland with a very distinctive um, uh, suite of plants uh, growing um, uh, in it. And uh, it was obvious that uh, conditions had changed completely. And we were able to tie that over time into uh, the uh, climate sequence for the Northern Hemisphere as we went from um, the uh, cool, but, um, or no, I'd better put it this way, the warmer, moister conditions of the Lake Glacial into the younger dry ass proper, which as we all know, was an episode of very cold, dry uh, climate across much of uh, the Northern Hemisphere. So we had this connection between the beginnings of farming and um, the onset of the younger dry ass. And then in time, as the Middle East and the rest of the world emerged from the Younger Dryas, and that took 1,000, 1,500 years, uh, and conditions became more favorable, we see that the agricultural activities of the people at Abu Huraira expanded. Uh, they developed a more mature farming economy. Um, they took on domestic animals, particularly sheep and goat, and in time, cattle and pigs. Uh, and out of that, uh, <clears throat> um, new way of life as it developed, uh, this made possible the growth of the settlement uh, uh, 
uh, into really a sort of something that had almost sort of town-like dimensions. It was a very large village indeed, with a population of probably five to eight thousand um, people. So we knew all of that before. Um, the opportunity came to look at those soil samples and to think about whether there might be some connection between that sequence of events at Abu Huraira and um, the uh, the extraterrestrial event that we now believe kicked off the Younger Dryas. This is so fascinating, Dr. Moore, because, and if I may, uh, I'd like to make a brief comparison uh, to timely things that are happening. There's much concern, of course, over the spread of a novel coronavirus in the world right now, but Based on what you're describing to me, there was tremendous change in the ancient world coincident with this Younger Dryas onset, and it seems that there is evidence that people adapted in one of the most unique and novel and, frankly, um, earth-changing ways that has ever been established, which, of course, involves agriculture. People invented a new way of gathering food which, of course, gives rise to civilization as we know it and the development of societies in response to tremendous changes. In your mind, does this underscore the fact that humans, when faced with adversity, always have ways of utilizing resourcefulness and moving past the conflicts and the challenges that they are met with? Um, I would say that that is one, uh, certain, one outcome, certainly. Um, <clears throat> The, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes uh, big changes in climate or natural catastrophes can overwhelm a society uh, in, in ways from which it's not uh, able to recover. But this is one of the examples um, in which humans did manage to adapt, apparently successfully, to very changed circumstances. Uh, but th there's a little bit more to it th than that. When we went to excavate Abu Huraira back in the 1970s, um, there had been a huge swing away from associating changes in the human past with any form of um, climate change. We were not supposed to associate uh, the big advances in uh, human society uh, with anything to do with the climate or the environment at all. Well, our evidence from Abu Huraira demonstrated precisely the opposite, that the link between climate change uh, in the greater, um, in, in greater Western Asia, in the Middle East, and what was happening at Abu Huraira was absolutely critical. Uh, the two things went step by step. As the climate and environment changed, as the vegetation changed, we could see at Abu Huraira that people were adapting to these changes in rather remarkable ways. But of course, the one thing that we were not factoring in uh, to our thinking at that stage, this was all already new enough, um, was the fact that there might have been, um, should we say, a natural disaster uh, um, taking place uh, with the onset of the younger Dryas that was driving all of this in ways that would have been quite um, unpredictable to us at the time that we were excavating the site. And what's been fascinating for me is to be able to resurrect from our um, you know, all those materials that we'd saved, resurrect uh, evidence that now, you know, we're able to study using the latest uh, techniques uh, and throw completely new light on what was happening at Abu Huraira. Dr. Moore, would you have ever thought in 1972 and 1973, when you first went to the site and when excavations were first undertaken, that we would see a site that would garner so much evidence of fundamental changes in the human past that actually shaped history and the formation of human civilization and society? Certainly not. When I stood on that site for the first time, I knew that we were, we, I was looking at the remains of a very large and therefore very successful Neolithic farming uh, village, uh, but I had absolutely no idea of what um, lay deeper beneath my feet. And remember, I was a 26-year-old graduate student when I stood on that site for the first time. Um, and I started to dig it when I was 27. It was an astonishing opportunity that the Syrian authorities gave me uh, to excavate uh, this site as part of that um, salvage campaign. And at that stage, I was very much focused on um, artifacts, flints, grinding tools, bone tools, 
pottery, this kind of stuff uh, that archaeologists um, love, I had less sense of where the economic evidence, which I knew was going to be important, I had less sense of where that might that might lead us. Um, so one one of the you know as we have um, pursued our investigation of the record from Abu Huraira, and I've been at that for nearly fifty years now. Um, you know, my own thinking has evolved very considerably along uh, the way. But uh, the lesson there is you have to go where the science and where the data take you uh, and be open minded about it and be ready to re rethink uh, phenomena uh, that you have um, uh, excavated in order to accommodate these new these new perspectives. Yeah. Dr. Moore, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I certainly hope that we'll have an opportunity to speak with you at some point again in the future, especially since I know your love for Scandinavian and Viking Age archaeology. So that's a whole nother conversation I hope we can have sometime. But I want to thank you for being our guest here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Thank you again to Dr. Andrew Moore for being our guest and discussing the very fascinating Abu Huraira site. I'm sure it won't be the last time we discuss that here on the show. And I think we'll probably look back and see that as a game changer. You know, that's going to be a very significant paper as it relates to the ongoing, the evolving story that we are uncovering of what exactly was happening around that time of the enigmatic Younger Dryas. And... Here again, it goes without saying, in the modern world, there's an awful lot going on. Uh, we've got a lot of changes, and as we often like to do, as we see things that are changing here in the present day, we look to the past and try and get a historical perspective on these things. I also am a fan, of course, of having a little levity, uh, and I think as we're always wrapping up, that's usually where we add a little of the fun stuff on this show. And so, without further ado... The History of Alcohol. Something a little unusual uh, this week for this edition of the show, because I'm sure everyone by now has been seeing the controversy that's been uh, circling uh, in the news cycles about people's attempts at finding uh, home remedies and cures and things for the coronavirus and the World Health Organization advising against things along these lines. Uh, for example... They actually have at their website as part of its public health response to COVID-19. The World Health Organization has worked with partners to develop a fact sheet which addresses myths and provides guidance during the pandemic. And one of those is actually titled Alcohol and COVID-19, What You Need to Know. Uh, because many people say, hey, you know, if I drink more whiskey or alcohol, maybe that will help sort of have a sterilizing effect. The World Health Organization says, no, that's not necessarily true. And they, of course, go on to say... Alcohol consumption is associated with a range of uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. One could probably imagine why, especially if you're going to a bar, you're using glassware, things along these lines. So they've got those advisories on their website. But I mentioned again that historical perspective on things, because around the time, again, 100 years ago or thereabouts, when we had the Spanish influenza, uh, many people during that era also looked at alcohol as a folk remedy, even if that wasn't necessarily going to be uh, curative or beneficial to them. And the Irish Times reports here in November 1918, the Irish Times reported the official view that the pandemic was beginning to decline, although figures for burials in Dublin cemeteries were still high. But they went on to say that treatments for influenza in 1918 were supportive rather than specific. And yes, they note that large doses of whiskey were popular. While in Limerick, local historian Des Ryan had written that, quote, some of the remedial cures included snuff, uh, a pack of towels soaked in vinegar that had been a cure during the Spanish influenza, uh, soda and sugar in a glass of hot milk, and yes, again, a strong dose of whiskey and ginger. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that after 100 years, you know, those ideas of the folk remedies and the cures and the things... Uh, still play a role in the cultural dialogue today, even though we now have more science to back up the idea that these are not necessarily going to be helpful. But that idea of the folk remedy has always interested me. And in the past, we talked about in one news story 
uh, an archaeological site where it seemed that a person had swallowed an entire whole rattlesnake. Do you guys recall that? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, remember absolutely. that. Absolutely. And the interpretation, of course, had been maybe this was a ceremonial process or this might have believed to have had a curative property. <laughs> so, you know, I'm awful glad that uh, these days science has taught us that swallowing whole rattlesnakes does not have any kind of benefit yeah. for health or anything else. But I think we can all safely say that, again, when we raise our glass here in the Cross Time Pub, we do that in the spirit of cheer, maybe with a little moderation, but of course also uh, in honor of friendship and all of the many topics that we all enjoy so much as we discuss here every week here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So, hey, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy out there. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcasts, and I hope you guys are enjoying uh, your weekend as it winds down. Yeah, so uh, I probably will have a little Kentucky bourbon uh, to my health and to your health. And James, uh, I'll probably have to join you on that. Uh, I do want to remind everyone, please rate and review the show. Uh, it's very important for us, and we do have a uh, new review by Pug7788, who expresses his admiration and love of our theme song and says that he would like to hear more episodes on the ancient mounds of Ohio and West Virginia. So again, we thank you very much for that rate and review. It's very important to the show. Remember, you can follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to all of those uh, social media outlets and let us know what you think about the show. Absolutely. So thanks to all of you guys out there. Thank you to you two gentlemen. I think I'm going to pour another hot cup of coffee before I do anything else. Hey, you know, the man of many beverages. So on behalf of all of us, I am Micah Hanks. He is Jason Pintrail, and he is James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire. And of course, we gather here together in the Crosstime Pub on each edition of this podcast. So you guys stay strong, stay safe, and stay healthy out there. And we will catch you again here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm-hmm.